And joining me now to discuss all of this is the National Security Advisor to the President, Jake Sullivan. Jake, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Let me start with uh, the, the, the assurances or lack of assurances that Ukraine is publicly asking for when it comes to NATO membership. Um, let me ask it this way. Their concern is this. By not having some sort of concrete commitment that it means that the idea of NATO's membership to NATO is still going to be there for negotiating an end of this war with Russia. How do you, how do you draw that line in the sand that says, you know, are you willing to say NATO's future membership in, in uh, Ukraine's future membership in NATO will never be a part of negotiating the end of this war? Well, I'm not sure we could have said it more clearly than the 31 allies said in the NATO communique, Chuck, which was Ukraine's future will be in NATO, period, full stop. That was a single clear sentence. It's not subject to negotiation with any country, including Russia. It is a subject only for the allies and for Ukraine. And what the rest of the document that was released at the NATO summit said was that uh, we will work on a pathway between here and when Ukraine actually joins to ensure that Ukraine gets an invitation to join NATO uh, when all allies agree and the necessary conditions are met. But that is not going to be subject to negotiation with Russia. It's, those, it's that phrase, necessary conditions, right? That he, and I know you've, you've already scrapped the, the one, that they're going to get the fast track that, that both Finland and Sweden got. But it's even that phrase seems to irritate Ukraine. Any reason to keep that in there? Well, what, what NATO allies have said is that every member of the alliance, every country that seeks to come into NATO has to meet certain democratic reform standards. And uh, Ukraine's own annual national program, which it agreed with uh, NATO some years ago, indicates that there are further steps it needs, needs to take along the democratic reform path. And if you talk to Ukrainian civil society activists, mm -hmm. even members of the Ukrainian government, they would say they want to continue down that reform path. NATO will work with Ukraine to ensure yeah. those reforms are completed. And when they are complete, Ukraine will be very much in a position um, to step forward and right. meet all of the requirements for coming into NATO. Hey, by the way, do you think NATO can, uh, NATO, do you think Ukraine can hold parliamentary elections this fall? Well, first, ultimately, the decision about how to play out parliamentary elections is up to Ukraine itself. It's not up to the United States. So I'm not going to opine on the steps they need to take mm -hmm. to ensure they're staying consistent with their constitution, only that we want to see that rule of law, democracy, and fidelity to the constitution are respected. And the Ukrainians will work out for themselves how that plays out with respect to elections this fall. Would it be a problem for the United States, though, if they postpone those elections? Uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We're in regular contact with the mm -hmm. Ukrainians about making sure, as I said before, right. that they're following the law, that they are remaining true to their democratic ideals. We'll continue to do that in the months ahead. I want to talk about uh, what's going on with Vladimir Putin. We have crossed a number of his so-called red lines when this war started. Finland and Sweden have joined NATO. That was a red line. Increasing NATO troops in Europe was a red line at one point for him. Supplying fighter jets and tanks to Ukraine was one time considered a red line. Providing long-range missile systems. We've done all of those things. Um, why do you think there, that, number one, why do you think there hasn't been a response by him, number one? And why do we, why do we take it, any other red line seriously with him? Well, at the beginning of this war, President Biden laid out the American position, which was we are going to take dramatic, bold steps to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We were going to ensure and sustain the unity of the West, and we were going to make sure that we did not end up in World War III with Russia, meaning U.S. troops fighting Russian troops in Ukraine or anywhere else. We have stood by those three basic precepts throughout this conflict, and as the conflict has evolved, the nature of our assistance to Ukraine has evolved with it. And we, of course, have learned along the way about what is possible and what is not possible. I can't speak to what's in the mind of President Putin. All I can say is that the basic U.S. position in this comes down to a single, clear, 
uh, point, which is we are going to support Ukraine without having U.S. boots on the ground and American soldiers fighting Russian soldiers, mm -hmm. and that will remain consistent throughout the course of this conflict. Um, are you concerned that Vladimir Putin is going to use the American political calendar, uh, that he wants to buy time and see what happens in the November 2024 elections? Well, it's fair to say that Vladimir Putin, from before this conflict began, had certain misconceptions about the United States and the West. Uh, he thought the United States would not step up and support Ukraine. He thought that the U.S. and uh, our European allies, NATO, would not be able to sustain unity. He thought the Ukrainians themselves would wither and collapse in the face of the mm -hmm. Russian attack. He's been proven wrong time and time again, and he was proven wrong again in Vilnius this past week when the NATO alliance came out stronger, larger, and more unified than at any point in history. So if, in fact, he is betting on American resolve to falter or fail, he is going to continue losing that bet. That's all I can say. Really? You don't think betting on uh, a, a different party becoming uh, controlling the White House uh, to... to that that isn't a bet he should make? Well, what I'm saying is that the United States, our NATO allies, and a larger coalition of nations around the world that have stepped up to provide unprecedented levels of support to Ukraine, all of that has flown in the face of Vladimir Putin's expectations. Mm -hmm. And I think he will continue to have his expectations dashed that the West right. is going to falter or crack in this. And all we can do in the Biden administration is yeah. get up every single day and work as hard as we possibly can alongside our allies and partners to get Ukraine what it needs as fast as it needs it to be able to succeed in this effort. Two things on the decision on cluster munitions. Number one, look, I understand, I understand the rationale. It's been explained. You've, you've painstakingly explained. And I know this is not a unanimous decision in NATO. But ha have we not lost our moral authority? on something like this as a leader on this stuff when it comes to, look, we just got rid of our chemical weapons and we've been trying to lead the world in getting rid of that. And we try to rhetorically lead the world in trying to, to, to get rid of these uh, barbaric um, weapons. And then here we are now still going into our stockpile and giving them to an ally. Does that not harm our moral authority? Well, Chuck, our moral authority has not derived from being a signatory to the Convention Against Cluster Munitions. We are not, we have not been at any point since that convention came into effect. Neither has Ukraine. Our moral authority and Ukraine's moral authority in this conflict comes from the fact that we are supporting a country under brutal, vicious attack by its neighbor with missiles and bombs raining down on its cities killing its civilians, destroying its schools, its churches, its hospitals. And the idea that providing Ukraine with a weapon in order for them to be mm -hmm. able to defend their homeland, protect their civilians, um, is somehow a challenge to our moral authority, I find questionable. I would say that we are stepping up to give Ukraine what it needs in order to not be right. defenseless in the face of a Russian onslaught. We are simply are, not going are, to leave Ukraine defenseless. The president right. was determined on that point, and we've remained committed to that. Is the United States out of the manufacturing of new cluster munitions? Are we, are we not going to... We, will we replenish this stockpile or not? We, our current plan is not to replenish the, that stockpile. It is okay. rather to build up the capacity to produce the unitary round uh, mm -hmm. the, of the 155, the non-cluster munition round right. of ammunition. We began that process months ago as we anticipated the need for continuing supply to Ukraine, mm -hmm. but it takes time. And that is why we need a bridge from today when we right. need to ensure that Ukraine has the necessary supply of ammunition to a few months down the road when we believe we can supply enough of the unitary round uh, to meet Ukraine's defense needs. Jake Sullivan, I have to leave it there. I know you have a busy morning ahead of you. Uh, appreciate you coming on and sharing the administration's perspective. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.